All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. So today our uh, speaker is Eitan Bahmat. Let me know if I said your name wrong, because I'm not sure. Yeah. That's good. Perfect. Um, and so, yeah, Eitan is uh, an associate professor of computer science at Ben Gurion University, and he's been working on uh, process optimization, systems engineering. He's been using techniques from math, physics, computer science. Um, and so today he's going to tell us about algorithmic fairness, and he's going to tell us about his, I mean, algorithmic fairness, but also hyperbolic minimum materials and like the journey that he's taken to go from one to the other. So looking forward and take it away. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to give uh, this talk. Uh, I'll start by, um, since I'm not really an algorithmic fairness person, uh, let me start just by introducing myself just a little bit. Uh, well, I am a privileged white male, you can all see that. Um, but I'm also a bi-scientist. It means that I'm attracted to theory and to applications. I do both. And uh, I, I'm also a multidisciplinarian, uh, interested in math, physics, uh, computer science theory, computation, operations research, biology, healthcare, and so on. And uh, being a multidisciplinary scientist is really hard and we're biased against, and, uh, but, uh, but it's fun on the other hand. It's a lot of fun being such a scientist. And uh, we're gonna, and today I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, cash-free science, so, so uh, no funding involved. Uh, okay, uh, so, and I have to start with, uh, this is a long list of uh, collaborators and people who are, I will collaborate with, I'll have a papers with probably in the, in the future, most of them, but, or people who have affected my thinking about the problems that we, that I'm gonna talk about. And uh, uh, there is nothing in common between these people, except that they work with me, <laughs> I think for the most part. So, so it's a long list of very sporadic uh, list of people. Okay, but uh, yeah, they've all contributed to this uh, and they should be acknowledged. Uh, okay, so the main scientific uh, message of my talk is uh, that is uh, to describe some object. Uh, tell you about, so the talk will be about a certain object, a mathematical object. And that object is given as follows. Suppose you have a distribution on points in the plane. And let's make our life simple. Let's say it has uh, uh, supported on a compact set. So, so there is some bounded domain and you only get uh, you only get points from that domain and suppose you have a bounded density function so 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 it's not like you don't have like dirac measures or or things which are singular it's a nice uh, measure it doesn't have to be continuous but but has should have a density function say uh, and so so a nice measure on uh, a compact set of points uh, in the plane if you want. Uh, and then you sample n points from this, uh, uh, from this uh, density function or from this distribution. And, uh, and uh, then you have n points in the plane. And when you have these n points, you, there is a, let's call it, uh, we have a nice partial order that we can put on points in the plane. And the partial order is uh, point A is bigger than point B if it's bigger in both coordinates. Say A is five and seven and, uh, and B is uh, three minus four, then A is bigger than B. But if A is five and seven and B is eight and minus three, then they're not in partially ordered. Okay, so that, that, that's the partial order. Now, uh, I sampled the points. So every time I sample, I'll get a different set of endpoints. And therefore, I'll also get a different partial order. Or not necessarily, but, but, but uh, there is a good chance that uh, the partial order will be a little bit different. So, it's, uh, so I, I think of this as 
of this gadget is providing me a stochastic partial order. Okay, so, so it's a random partial order, but it's not uniformly random. These are very certain partial orders uh, typically, but uh, I don't just get anything usually. Uh, I even can't get every partial order this way, and uh, that's been proven. But um, but um, I I'm interested in the behavior of a typical partial order that I get this way, okay? And what I want to do is I'm interested in the asymptotics of this object. So I want to sample a lot of points, okay? So I'm going to sample more and more points, and I'm going to ask what does a typical, what does the typical partial order uh, look like? And that depends on the distribution that I started with, okay? So that's the object. And what I'm, and my main message is, if you somehow see that in your research, this object appears, uh, embrace it. It's an amazing thing to study. <laughs> Okay, and, and it's, uh, it just has, it's a fascinating object to look at. Okay, so, so that's the main scientific magic, uh, uh, message. If you somehow get, somehow view the, get, get to this object, somehow it appears in your research, uh, start digging and, and look uh, further into this. So, so that's, that's, so, now you can leave this talk. You you got the message, <laughs> but I'll try to maybe explain a little bit more why I, I find this so uh, fascinating and so on. And sometimes you have to you know tweak and maneuver and transform your problem to see this object. Okay, it, it might not appear uh, immediately to you that 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 what you're studying is related to this object, so you might have to work a little bit, but but it's worth working on. Okay, and uh, so it has many incarnations and you need some reductions you have to somehow, sometimes you just need to reduce your problem to this uh, to make it work. Okay, uh, where does this object appear? Okay, so there is a paper in Fox uh, 96, since it's in Fox, I consider that theoretical computer science. And uh, the paper is about, uh, it's essentially the traveling salesman problem in disk drive. So uh, you get N requests to read, say, just read data from different parts of a disk drive. And disk drive is this old object that rotates and uh, has some arm that moves radially inside and outside the, the disk drive. And, and because there is a geometry here, there is mechanical motion. Uh, the order in which you access the requests uh, changes your um, your service time by quite a bit. The order really matters. Uh, for example, data on the disk drive is is usually uh, if you put a, if you place a a, a film uh, a movie on a disk drive, you put it in sequential order. You put it at at uh, concentric rings, which are one next to each other at, at very proximal radii. And then you read it very efficiently. But if I ask you to view the movie in random order of the frames, that will take the disk drive a lot of time to gather that data out of order, out of sequence, okay? So uh, Andrews, Bender, and Zhang, uh, they, uh, they well, they were students at Harvard at the time, and they, they uh, and they were uh, asking uh, if I give you the locations of n pieces of data, what is the best way to uh, access them? So solve the traveling salesman problem so that you will actually read everything in the least amount of time, and uh, and. This seems to have nothing to do with the, the previous slide, but in this case, after you transform and, and you'll see what exactly the object is that you have, uh, you, you can convert that into, uh, it, it's very closely related, especially if you wanna know how many rotations of the disk drive are required to handle the data, but also 
uh, what is the ordering and the optimal ordering, then uh, then it's essentially boils down to some process on this partial order that I gave in the previous slide, that I described in the previous slide. And, uh, and uh, the distribution depends on uh, how the IO requests are distributed on the disk drive. That's actually the distribution uh, that is associated with that. Uh, it's not points in the plane necessarily, but the, the disk drive is, uh, you have to think about it as a cylinder and it is a cylinder. Okay, then, uh, uh, and uh, I've done work on that. And then there is uh, something in quantum gravity called the causal set program, uh, which describes the universe as a partial order on finite number of points. Uh, the points, uh, so essentially they say that the universe is just uh, many, 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 many events which are events is a point in time and in space. And uh, there are only finally many of those. Uh, this idea was uh, uh, sort of uh, invented at the same time by uh, Mirheim, who never published it. He was the postdoc at CERN. And by Tooft, who was uh, he's a Nobel Prize winner who is known for uh, amazing, but sometimes uh, controversial ideas. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and Mirheim saw that Tooft published something on that and decided not to publish his take on this. And then it, this was developed uh, by uh, people in the quantum gravity community. Uh, the, I'm named here a few of them. Uh, Raphael Sorkin from uh, the Perimeter Institute is probably the leading figure and uh, many, many others uh, that I mentioned. And uh, that turns out to be related if you think about two-dimensional universes uh, or uh, a particle moving along on a wire, if you want, one space dimension, one time dimension, then it's very strongly related to these objects that I described. Uh, and uh, another case is airplane boarding. You and two, 300 other people board an airplane. Uh, you're doing, a distributed computation. The computation is you go into the airplane, you sit, you each person sits down, eventually the project ends in the sense that everybody's seated and the airplane can take off, okay? That's the end of airplane board. What is this? Uh, so if you think about this as a computation done in parallel by two, 300 people, the question is what the hell are you computing? Uh, you're computing, uh, uh, what is the boarding time? What, what, what area of mathematics is that related to? Uh, it turns out, and here again, you have to do some uh, playing around that what you're actually computing, you're computing the longest chain in one of these, uh, uh, in one of these uh, stochastic partial orders. Uh, and the partial order depends on the airline policy and also on the physical interior of the airplane, how it's organized. And uh, these map into a distribution and, uh, and then you're computing the longest increasing, uh, the longest chain, which is the longest increasing subsequence in this. Okay, so that's an, another place where you encounter this. And, uh, and then there is a whole industry field, huge field, in physics and in math called uh, uh, carter parisi Zhang, uh, longest increasing subsequence, polynuclear growth model. Um, and, and this is just a huge field in which you look at various growth processes uh, in condensed matter physics or uh, in uh, sometimes you look at fermions uh, sometimes and and this is a field where which has many amazing results uh, very serious people have been working on this uh, several fields medalists and uh, nobel prize winners and what uh, and uh, probably you will see it under carter parisi jang is usually 
the name you'll see them. And then there is uh, questions about Pareto optimality and something called simplicial Carter Parisi Zhang, uh, which again, these things uh, appear. So, so if you uh, if you look at the maximal elements of such a partial order, then uh, these are Pareto optimal solutions to something. If these two numbers that you have, the points in the plane, they have two numbers, and you're trying to uh, maximize something, then you can choose one of these points. Each one of them is not dominated by any other point if it's a maximal point of the partial order. So when you look at Pareto optimality questions, then these objects again arise. Okay. So uh, and uh, and and the list actually goes on, but I, I thought I thought that that would be. And uh, just as an example, uh, uh, this is a picture from a paper of Ferrari on uh, something called polynuclear growth process, which you see on the left hand side. So uh, this is think about. Uh, uh, Okay, this is a two dimensional example, but, but essentially you think about having a super saturate and some uh, flat uh, table or something like that. And then you think of these particles nucleating and then they spread, they nucleate more nucleation events attached to them and, and these spread in circles or in disks. And on top of them, there are new nucleation. So this is a growth process for a crystal or something like that. Uh, and uh, the nucleation events are shown here on the left as these points. And on the right, uh, Patrick Ferrari, just who is a mathematical physicist, it, he shows that in rotated form. And now it's the, this is the longest increasing subsequence. If you think of these, of the points as, um, as the points that you've drawn out of the, how many are there, uh, six, nine, 10 points. So. You sampled n equals 10 points from the uniform distribution on this uh, rectangle. And uh, this is a process now, the, the same thing that with the nucleation is now what is called patient sorting. And it computes the longest increasing subsequence among these points. That is, uh, a sequence is increasing if each point is uh, has bigger co coordinates, both coordinates bigger than the previous point. And you see from 0, 0, there is a path here going to x plus t, t minus x, and that path, which has four points on it, those four points are the longest increasing subsequence in this example. So this shows you that uh, this longest increasing subsequence and this polynuclear growth are very, very closely connected to each other. At least in one plus one dimension, polynuclear growth is a bit more general in this case. Okay. Now, in terms of methodologies, how do you study, how do these people study this object? Uh, so the basic idea is that they look at very special examples. One example is take the uniform distribution on an axis parallel uh, uh, rectangle or square, the right-hand side here. So this is a very special case. You look at the uniform distribution on that, in that case. And then you have a lot, a lot, a lot of extra structure. Uh, there is an enormous amount of structure here, both combinatorial, algebraic, and, uh, and then that allows you to give very exact results. Like, for example, if you sample uniformly endpoints from the from axis parallel rectangle, and you look for the longest chain in this uh, random partial order, what is known as the longest increasing subsequence in a random permutation, uh, people know after 50 years of work just about anything about this distribution. <clears throat> and very, very exact analysis. And that uses, I've given here a very partial list of uh, combinatoric spatial sorting, Robinson, Shenstead, Knuth, algebra, representation theory, random matrix theory, Tracy Witham, uh, complex analysis, everything. And it really is everything and the kitchen sink that people throw at these problems. And they get very, very, very uh, strong and exact results. Usually you don't need the, your, the results to be that exact. 
in applications. On the other hand, uh, you might need something which is not the uniform distribution. So now there is, you start trading. So, okay, people know everything about these examples and let's try to reduce to these few examples. And that's the strategy. So you reduce to these special cases, you get less information, but since you started out with amazing information, you sometimes hope to, uh, st at the end of the day, to have good information, okay? On more general cases, which are not, don't have all this fabulous algebraic structures associated, because algebra is not, uh, if, if you've changed a little bit of details, algebra doesn't like, changes. It's, uh, it's a very rigid object, okay? And combinatorics is pretty rigid, so. Okay, uh, how do I look at this? Well, what is my novel, if you want, take on this? I look at this uh, geometrically. That's the way I like to think about it. Uh, it, it is very closely related to uh, this uh, causal set thing that I mentioned. Uh, and uh, the kind of geometry that you actually want uh, that is appropriate for this case is what is known as uh, space-time or Lorentzian geometry. So th this is the geometry that, uh, that uh, describes relativity theory, both special and general relativity theory. Uh, special relativity theory is, is like having uniform distributions in some sense. And if you take other distributions, you put curvature and all kinds of funny stuff. And then you get into all these uh, uh, things that you have typically in differential geometry. You can talk about geodesics, which are maximal increasing subsequences. They're discrete geodesics. Uh, maximal hypersurfaces, uh, conjugate points where geodesic like in lenses, they come together. Uh, there's a curvature that you can, can talk about. There is length, volumes, uh, all these wonderful things. And the point is, why is, our, why is this related to uh, this uh, partial orders? The reason is that the choice of a distribution plus this partial order structure uh, of being, if you're bigger, if you're bigger in both coordinates, that is exactly what a two-dimensional space-time manifold is. That, that, that's, uh, you need a little theorem of Gauss, but essentially uh, that uh, conformal uh, flat, two-dimensional manifolds are conformally flat, but this is essentially the same object. So we're taking uh, something which describes uh, relativistically how the motion of a particle along some uh, wire and uh, that and uh, these kind of things is, and if we sample that, if we just make it discrete, it's the same object, okay? And then if, if this object comes from differential geometry, you expect that answers to your questions about this object will also be in terms of differential geometry. For example, if you look at the longest uh, chain, or the longest anti-chain, those are related to uh, geodesics in, uh, in this uh, geometry or so on. And uh, so uh, I give here one example at the bottom of the slide. Uh, okay, I have to, there are some qualifications, but essentially if, if you're trying to look at chains or either longest chains or easy, just any random chain in this object, it will follow, if I just choose randomly a chain uh, in this uh, object, it will follow a geodesic in this uh, associated uh, space-time geometry. And one conclusion you can draw from this is that the motion of the earth around the sun is essentially drawn from a hat. It's uniformly random for any period of less than six months that you take. You, you ask the sun, you see where it is, you ask the sun to be where it will be in three months and say, you can choose what to do whatever you want. You can uh, move uh, away from the sun and then back and fly to outer space, anything under the speed of light. I give you three months to be, 
<laughs> where you should be in three months. Uh, and if the Earth draws, uh, I don't know, a million times from a hat, this, the trajectory that it should take, it always points to the same thing, and it is a traje trajectory that it actually picks. So there is the universe is completely lawless in that sense. <laughs> okay, the the motion of, of planets is completely right. Uh, okay, uh, it. Yeah, this is a little bit counterintuitive, but but there is a five minute explanation that I can convince. Okay, uh, very nice, but what the what the hell does that have to do with fairness? Uh, so uh, let's look at linear extensions in this object. Okay, so so you have a partial order, and you want to rank the points. Okay. You want to rank the points. And um, for example, let's look at a case of this is that uh, your partial order is uh, the set. So the points in the plane are your set, the SAT score and the GPA of students who you want or uh, who are applicants to your university. Okay. Now, the situation in, in Israel is that uh, that's the two numbers that you get when you evaluate a student, actually. And you have to choose, and essentially you want to rank the students. So you want to find a full uh, order, which extends the partial order. That is, if one student has both better grades in both in the GPA and the set, they will be ranked higher than uh, their colleague who has lesser grades. Uh, in both these grades are not as good. So uh, we so we want consistent, ex we want linear extensions of the partial order, which you can th think of as consistent rankings, rankings which are consistent with the partial data that we have on. Uh, and the, again, this is very real in college admissions and also in healthcare. Uh, a patient can have two scores. One is what is their risk? We don't want to treat people who are uh, healthy. There's no point in that. So they should be at risk. Uh, but on the other hand, not everybody at risk, we can actually help them. So the, another number is how effective can we be in trying to treat whatever that person has. And from that two numbers, we want to come up with some decision about how should we rank the patients uh, in order of urgency because we have limited resources, we can't take care of everybody. So we want to try to find, uh, and this is sort of like a pre-fairness question in the sense that uh, I didn't even talk about subpopulations, but you want to study the space of all linear extensions in order to have some idea, before you even start talking about fairness, you should, what are you facing here, okay? So this is pre-fairness in some sense, but it can also help you with uh, thinking about fairness problems. Uh, okay, so now uh, program, uh, well, look it up in the internet, uh, it's borrowed from Grothendieck, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, here's some idea of what, of what I plan to look at. And so, so now I'm gonna describe how I, would like to think about this. I, I don't really have uh, uh, many results yet, but, but this is just more of a way of thinking and all kinds of things that it leads me to. Uh, so, uh, now, there are many modeling issues, uh, different, if we are going to talk about fairness, there are different subpopulations which will have different distribution, joint distributions of, joint distributions of uh, SAT and GPA, say, okay? And the sampling is not always IID. If you have people going to the same high school, then they're not going to be independent necessarily in their scores. Uh, but you know, we have to start somewhere, and this is difficult enough even without uh, looking at that. And we can also add one more additional element, which is minimal requirements. There are many people that uh, we're not going to consider. For example, healthy people, we, we don't want to consider no matter how effective we can be somehow or whatever. So, so you might want to have some minimal requirements. 
And so uh, one result the, the, that can be stated in very general terms about these things is actually that the space of linear extensions is uh, a compact space. This, the space of consistent rankings of uh, these objects is a compact space. Uh, and uh, if you want to see why, uh, you can look at, uh, so Penrose uh, is, is a, okay, um, you can look at Witten's lectures if you're a brave person, but, but they're actually pretty easy to follow. Uh, and he explains why the space of all, um, okay. Now I'm going to, uh, okay. It, it essentially follows from something called the Orzella Scali theorem about uh, equicontinuous e uh, function. Okay, uh, now, so you can ask yourself how many, and here's a question to the crowd if somebody wants a challenge problem, uh, which I think is good for graduate students. Uh, if I give you some epsilon and ask you uh, how many rankings do I have to give so they cover up to epsilon any other covering, so meaning that the ranking of, uh, of each person or each uh, entity uh, will, will, will be epsilon different at most, epsilon times the number of entities, epsilon at, at most between that and any given rank, uh, that you cover all rank possible rankings up to this epsilon distance measure. And uh, uh, you, you can just get better and better estimates. And th that's a, if, if I had to choose a, a question to start looking at these things, which uh, seems to be very doable, then I would do this one. Uh, now, how do people usually take two numbers and convert them into one? You have a GPA and you have a, a SAT score, how do people usually convert them into one score? They take a weighted average, okay? So let's think of this as method number one of finding a ranking. Let's take a weighted average. What I wanna point out is that there is a little bit of a problem with that because you haven't looked at the joint distributions of the two scores, of the GPA and, and the SAT score, you just, um, it's a formula. It doesn't even look at the data. <laughs> when you take this formula, you, you, you never look at the data actually. So I think of that as a problem and uh, it might not be consistent with the minimal requirements in the sense that uh, the people with the minimal requirements can be, have very different rankings using this weighted average. Uh, and um, uh, okay, and then ignore the last point that I'm, that I wrote down here. Okay, but so the last point was uh, so uh, this method you can apply it also for these disk drives uh, that I mentioned at the beginning, and when you look at disk drives from the point of view of space-time geometry you're looking at something called the Einstein universe. And this is a picture taken from Penrose's book, uh, booklet in 1972. And, um, and this actually, uh, if, if you look, stare long enough as this picture, you understand the Andrews Bender Zhang algorithm for solving the traveling salesman problem. Uh, but uh, essentially, the ranking here is uh, just the y coordinate. Uh, if you, uh, this is not in the plane, this is in uh, on a cylinder, and you have to unravel that to get something on the plane. But uh, essentially, you have this uh, let's call it canonical ranking, which is just by the height of a point. So suppose you have a lot of points sampled in the cylinder, and you just rank them by. So this is going to be the Einstein Friedman universal for some reason, I'll call it. And uh, now let's discuss uh, some other possible methods. <laughs> so you can, 
say that the height or ranking of uh, an element is essentially the cha longest chain from the minimal requirements to that element. <clears throat> and um, you can study that. And this leads to, this is essentially what airplane boarding does. For you. And it also, it's also how the universe evolves. Uh, for explanation why this is how the universe evolved, you can look at Witten's, <laughs> sorry, uh, lectures uh, at, on, uh, they're on YouTube, uh, his recent course on in uh, physics for graduate students. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's this, the problem with my talks is that I, you have to know a little bit about many things. Uh, okay, anyway, so <laughs> this method works and gives you the same answer, which is just ranking by the uh, Z axis here on the same type of universe. So it agrees looking at the longest chain from the minimal L requirements of the minimal requirements are uh, sort of a circle here. Then it gives you the same answer as the previous method, which was just taking averages, okay? So you have something, but this, this thing does not ignore the joint distribution. So you have a method which sort of doesn't ignore the joint distribution, that on particularly nice and symmetric examples gives you the same answer as the averaging, but in some sense will generalize a little bit better. It's more fair, it, it, it takes into account the data, which should be a fair thing to do. <laughs> if you wanna describe fairness, you should look at the data at some point. Uh, and now, okay, but it has a problem because I, I looked at the chain from the minimal elements and I could have looked at the chains uh, starting from an element and going to a maximal element. Uh, so there is a, so I only looked at one piece of things which are below my element, but I can look at the things which are above my element and, and look at the, if I have an element, I can look at the longest chain emanating from it going upwards, uh, divided, uh, I'm sorry, the, the longest chain ending in it, so going backwards, divided by the longest chain going forwards. And that's more symmetric. And it looks at the data, okay? And so this is, this is better in some ways because it, because it doesn't depend only on the minimal elements, it, it looks in both ways. And if you look at, again, the, this Einstein-Friedman universe, it gives you the same thing as as the average and as the previous method. So, so these are different methods, which, and I'm improving them a little bit each time, but, uh, but they agree on some very symmetric option. Okay. And then there is another symmetrized option and that is just counting the number of elements below my element divided by the number of elements above. All these things, by the way, have nothing to do with uh, the particular partial orders that I give you. You can apply them on anything apart from the average. In general, the average is not embedded into a vector space, so you can average. But, 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 it, but, it, but here, uh, all these other methods, just looking at chains and counting and elements above and below, they're defined in, intrinsically in terms of the partial order. So you can apply them in general. But I'm saying that somehow they are even more interesting in this uh, two-dimensional case that I mentioned. And actually this other symmetrized option, also if you're in this nice symmetric disk drive setting, it gives you the same thing. So the question becomes, how far are we in real situations and what I want to say, you can think of each one of these as giving some fairness criteria. So two elements are going to be ranked equally if they, if the ratio of the things they dominate divided by the, what they are dominated by is the same. So you can think of that as the notion of fairness. And we know that different notions of fairness are not necessarily consistent. And these four methods are not consistent in general. Uh, but there are cases where they are consistent. And I would like, and 
and okay, and I want to introduce one more. And the other one, and the, the, this one more is just take, pull out of a hat any consistent ring. Okay, so this is all things being equal from the data that I have. The only thing that I can conclude is that the ranking has to be consistent with the data. And, and beyond that, I, I try to be completely fair and just draw one out of a hat. Okay, this is difficult, by the way. There are algorithmic questions. Can we do it quickly in these specific partial orders? In general, there's an n to the third times log n procedure. Uh, and maybe with high dimensional expanders work, or especially that of Nima Anari, maybe on these particular examples, maybe we'll be able to do better. For example, computing longest chains are, is easier on these examples. There's the patient sorting, which is almost linear. And there, there are many, many interesting, this is a very global, uh, in terms of a, a growth model, nothing is known about it. And anything you can say about random extensions, uh, would be awesome because nobody knows anything about this. Uh, but actually, if you look at just, again, this example of the cylinder, this will give you the same answer as all the, the other methods. And what I want to say, okay, if all these different methods give me pretty much the same answer, maybe that's a good ranking, okay? It's not the type of notions of, uh, of fairness that you guys in, in computational complexity kind of tend to think about, but, but if, 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 you know, I try seven different things and they all give me the same answer and they're quite reasonable, then maybe they're natural somehow for it. And then the question becomes, how far are we from this Einstein Friedman cylinder picture? So I tried that on 15,000 uh, college candidates at my university. And they're pretty close to uh, Einstein Friedman universe. So, so, and that's actually how they're accepted. Usually you take a average of their GPA and SAT scores, but now I have a justification for that. I actually didn't think it would work, but, but it turned out that that and all the other methods pretty much gave the same ranking of the students. Okay, and uh, this is uh, two students, Guy Berner and Mort Dagan helped me do that. Uh, so it gives me, I would say more confidence. Okay, taking the average did not look at the data, but once you looked at the data, okay, it made actually sense. <laughs> uh, so it gives you more confidence. And if it doesn't make sense, maybe you should move to one of these other methods that looks at the data, okay? And essentially, there's more to this. This is uh, this uh, cylinder is a lens, and you can relate this to optics. And optics also give you some ideas of fairness. Lenses and optics have some fairness kind of qualities uh, that I don't think I'll have time to discuss. Uh, and what about physical implementations? So thinking about these things and uh, some. Uh, other motivations coming from airplane boarding uh, sort of led me to consider some lenses in this uh, space-time geometry. And then I shared that with uh, Andrea Alu's lab. Uh, Andrea Alu is a, is a leading uh, engineer, a physicist in uh, Pune. And uh, he, and he tried, so, so these are lenses again, these are actually lenses for, uh, for positive mass particles in uh, space-time geometry. So this is gravitational lensing, say for electrons or something like that. And these lenses actually, which are shown on the left, uh, the lens actually captures sort of all these uh, electrons or whatever and puts them in phase at, the other point. And when I suggested that to Andrea and actually uh, they tried using their own software, which, uh, which uh, makes simulates and also optimizes uh, lenses and what is this is called hyperbolic uh, uh, lensing, if you want, or hyperbolic metamaterials. Uh, met hyperbolic metamaterials are materials where 
waves actually behave as in space time and not in regular geometry, not in Euclidean space, but rather in Minkowski space. And actually what you see on the right hand side here is that we get exactly the same shape. And, uh, but you have to, so you can think of uh, these waves and these materials as producing a non-commutative version of airplane boarding. But if you put on them some correct uh, uh, um, boundary conditions, uh, it actually matches airplane boarding fairly well. Uh, so on the left is the best way to, uh, to, uh, to actually board slow and fast passengers. And, uh, and this leads to these uh, lenses and this metamaterials, uh, which actually, uh, if they will be done in uh, light, in, in theory at least gives you infinite resolution because uh, for various properties that I won't get into. Uh, yeah, sorry th that the talk is a little bit cryptic, but uh, again, I'm very associative thinker. <laughs> so, so all these things are related somehow. And, and this is just to show that this, this is real science. I mean, I always aspired that one of my papers will look serious enough to be in a serious journal on science. And you, you can see these are serious pictures. And this is, this is the we'll we'll build the lens will be built from something like this <laughs> and this little piece of plastic is very exciting to me so this can also this little piece of plastic can rank students or patients okay <laughs> uh, you have you can engineer it to do all kinds of different rankings and you can try to actually implement fairness into this piece of plastic and uh, and by looking at the waves how waves